Okay, well, we are excited to be with you tonight, as we were the, excited to be with you this morning. And um, Straw and I have been on an incredible adventure. Um, for those of you who are 18 and under, all I can say is uh, don't let anything take you away from the adventure God has for your life. Um, it's uh, been amazing for us. Both of us uh, came to board actually when we were in college. We'll share a little bit about that. But the last years have, have been an adventure. We've been in ministry over 40 years, which is hard to believe that somebody not 40 plus too much has been in ministry that long. Um, but anyway, the, the reality is we're going to take you on a, a little bit of a journey to share the journey that actually First Baptist Church of Avoca has been on with us since the beginning. And so let's begin the journey. And maybe before I begin, maybe I should try. Okay? Father, we love you so much. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for a great day. Thank you for a beautiful day. Uh, to walk with you, to love you, and to know your love. And I uh, thank you for everybody here tonight. I'd ask that you, Holy Spirit, would encourage them in terms of your faithfulness uh, through many years for us and the adventure we have yet before us. So uh, God us now encourages us to love you more and walk with you uh, more closely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 1972 is when we began the adventure with crew. And actually, uh, there was a little bit that went on before that. And so I'm going to let Char just share a little bit about what happened prior to 1972. That really is us. <laughs> really? So um, this picture and the situation was actually um, between our junior and senior years at the universities, different universities. But a little bit of my story, very brief, very brief, is that I grew up in Avoca and actually was very religious, the only one in my family who ever went to church. Um, not this church, but a couple churches that aren't there anymore. One burned down and one was bulldozed down. But. Um, anyway, I went to those churches growing up by myself and was very involved, so very religious person, understood a lot about God, but did not understand what it meant to know God. And so I went away to the university, and long story short, my second semester, second year, is when a girlfriend of mine, who happened to be Jewish, started talking to me and saying, Char, you're a Christian, what do you think about this? And so she started showing me different materials, and I'm like, well, yeah, I'm Christian because I'm not Jewish. And that's just what I thought. Growing up in this neighborhood, you can understand that, right? And so I started to see great changes in Janet's life. And through a process, she communicated to me that it was because she had understood that Jesus was the Messiah that the Jewish people had been looking for. And that she now had a personal relationship with him, and he was the one that she attributed to the changes in her life. So that drew me in, and I heard more, and understood the gospel, and that's when I came to Christ. And now it's your turn. Oh, right. So, um, then, fast forward to between my junior and senior year, there was an opportunity with crew, which was Campus Crusade for Christ at the time, to be on a summer missions project in Ocean City, New Jersey. And so um, my parents let me go, and I spent the summer down there where I got a job, and then I was involved with about 100 other students from across the country, actually, who had come to uh, be together, to learn more about Christ, to learn more about leadership um, in Christian ministry, and to share our faith with people that were down there for <laughs> And that's where I kind of came into the uh, picture of this one from Avoca. Uh, we met on the, the beach project, and 
it's it's interesting that um, how how God sometimes works, and we may or may not go into too much detail on our relationship. We'll figure that out as we go along. But anyway, I I went. I'm from South Jersey, um, and grew up in a. Uh, a family that sometimes went to church, my mother especially, and she would take me to church sometimes, and, and um, I thought I believed in God, and in a way I did believe in God, but like Char, I never heard, heard truly the gospel, how I could really have a relationship with Christ, what it meant for Christ to be my Savior and the Lord of my life, and so I grew up with the belief that, well, there's a God, so you should be good, and that was about it. My sophomore year in college, I, uh, through, uh, after a several month process of searching, I ended up rejecting Christianity. I believe that was one of the biggest farces out there. And uh, I became very antagonistic to Christianity. I looked into Eastern religions. I didn't find them intellectually satisfying at all. So I became indifferent towards them. But watch out if you identified yourself as a Christian because I was going to challenge you up one side and down the other in every way I possibly could. Because it, deep down inside, if there was a God, I wanted to know him. But I just couldn't find anybody who could give me a decent answer to why I should believe in God. And so, uh, but it was actually through the Ocean City, New Jersey Beach Project, the year before this project, in 1970, that I met... Uh, university students who were the first ones that I ever met who could express why they believed and and really had life transformation in, in their lives. And so I came to faith and then the next summer I was on the beach project and that's where I met my honey. Now this woman is known as my honey all around the world and that's who she is. And so anyway we met on the beach project and then, something else happened a year later. And there we are, we got married here in Avoca. And that began the adventure that God had for both of us uh, for the last over 40 years. And uh, we got married, I had a job in South Jersey. We went, we lived there and worked for a while. But then we had, our life had changed so much, so dramatically um, after we came to Christ that our heart's burden was really for all the people who didn't know him. Uh, and so we really had a desire to go into ministry. And after we worked for a while, God led us to go into ministry. And we had both come to faith through the ministry of crew at the university. And so we really desired to stay with crew at least for one or two years to gain two years of training in ministry that they provided for those that would join them. And so that was our intent. And so what we did is we joined crew staff and we went into the high school ministry. And uh, for the two years after we raised our initial support, we spent it in Oklahoma because they had good trainers for high school ministry for us there. And uh, we had a great time out in Oklahoma, uh, but the, the reality is, is we went through incredible culture shock in Oklahoma, because where I grew up in my hometown, there's about eight churches. Every one of them is either, uh, it's Roman Catholic or it's a very liberal Protestant church. Um, there was one Baptist church that if you were lucky, I think a few people may have come to faith through it, because the gospel was intertwined with other things. Um, but really, the need back east was for people to understand the gospel for the first time. And the two years we spent out in Oklahoma, we shared our faith a ton of times. But almost everybody had heard the gospel. In fact, the guy I took the most with out in Oklahoma was a, a, a guy who was a non-Christian, and he was Jewish. And uh, we related to each other <laughs> in, in a way that I, yeah, I could really connect with him. So anyway, 
We spent two years in the ministry, wanted to come back east. And the other thing is that I, we really miss the environment um, of a university and the interchange that can go on there between ideas and conversations and everything. And so if we came back east and went with the campus ministry, we were able to, uh, to do that. And so we went to Westchester University in Pennsylvania, and we spent uh, two years of, of ministry in there. Following that, I became the director of the ministry at the University of Delaware and saw God do incredible things uh, in the five years that we were there. We went from um, involvement of students, probably starting out with about 30, and uh, our prayer goal was to get to 303 years. That actually began after a number of months of praying. And we never reached the 300, but we got to about 270. And so God really did a lot in the movement there. It was really exciting. We saw, uh, as a result of our ministry there, 34 students graduate from that university in our five years there that went into full-time Christian work. So it was kind of exciting. Uh, after that period of time, they challenged us to become the area directors in New York and New Jersey. And so we, uh, after a lot of prayer, decided to do that. We moved up to Ithaca, New York, and began to oversee all the ministries on the secular campuses in New York and New Jersey. And there you can see our three sweethearts. Okay, the old, tallest and oldest is Michelle. The second one is Jen, Jennifer. And the third little one is Christy. And so... Uh, this was probably about 1984, actually, I would say that shot was, and when we, we lived in Ithaca. Well, I did the job as an area director for five years, and I really enjoyed a lot of aspects of it, and Char as well was involved with things, and as well raising and focusing a lot of attention with the girls. Um, but I would travel around to different campuses and, and share and speak and usually connect with a few students and, and we really, yeah, it would be a lot of fun. But the problem is, is I would just get to those campuses like once each semester or twice a year and then I might see them at a, a retreat, whether it would be a fall or a winter conference. But there wasn't the ongoing relationship and connection with the same students. And I really missed that. And so then crew came up with this uh, creative idea where somebody would be an area director and a campus director at the same time. And that sounded like the perfect solution to my dilemma. And so uh, Princeton University, uh, the, I was overseeing the director there, he was leaving the next year, and so we jumped at the opportunity to go down and continue, for me to continue as the area director in New York, New Jersey, but also assume the responsibilities as campus director at Princeton. Uh, by design, I was supposed to have a strong team around me, but the problem with some designs is that they fall far from reality in reality. And so instead of some strong, well-trained people alongside of me, um, I had two new staff guys that I had to train from bottom up. And so it really became quite the job and a little bit too much, to tell you the truth. But uh, I'll let Char now go on and share with you some things about our ministry at Princeton. So the two of us actually functioned on the campus for a little while and then became clear that Ron just couldn't do that full time while I was, or while he was trying to do the other job. Um, but in the process, these are just some pictures that represent some of the things we did with the university students. Um, up to the left there, the ski safari, they have an unusual time for their break between semesters after their exams are over. It's the end of January. And we would take them to New England, and they would have basically a week where we would pour into their lives through um, Bible study and training, and I would cook for... Well, the biggest was a hundred people for a couple of times. That was fun. <laughs> uh, and I just saw a lot built into their lives, and they could go skiing, and they could go sledding, and they could go skating, but, you know, we had definite times where we did training and teaching and challenging for them. Um, we're not supposed to have favorites in ministry, but... 
<laughs> yeah, and the reason they were my favorites, I think, of all the years that we were there, was because their hearts were so teachable. You know, they they were humble for Princeton students. That's 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 pretty good. They were humble and they were just um, extremely teachable, and I loved all of them. Um, we had. Of course, we had retreats, but that is just representative of one of the women's retreats that I put together and took the women on. Uh, and then this picture down here is Ron and our daughter, Jen. Jen had studied for two years in China. And so Ron took some guys from Princeton to China on a, on a vision trip. And Jen went with them as kind of the one who could speak the language and get around. And, and show them. So we just did a multiplicity of things with them, and it was just a fantastic, fantastic time of ministry. Well, that time um, uh, continued, and then actually the uh, crew went through a restructuring, and we went from having 20 areas in the country to 10 regions. And so we were already living in New Jersey, ministering to the students at Princeton. And they, in, in reorganizing things, they totally obliterated my area. They destroyed it. Because New York went with New England, and New Jersey went with the Mid-Atlantic States. And so, ah, it was uh, rather emotionally challenging. A little bit, and I'm just kidding you a little bit. And uh, so, but anyway, because we lived in New Jersey, we went with the Mid-Atlantic region, and we had had some experience previously that we haven't told you about in, international, in the international ministry in the country of Romania. And so the only way I figured out I could continue to have involvement with the students at Princeton and do a regional job was to take what was called the WSN Worldwide Student Network or the Global Missions Job. And I still had a high value of connecting and staying with the students, and so that's what we decided to do. And so we became a part of the Mid-Atlantic region. Our mission is to turn law students into Christ Center laborers. And the six states that are involved there is New York, or New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia. West Virginia, and uh, Washington, D.C., which isn't on there. And as well, over the years, we grew to have six international partnerships. And so the scope of those six states, basically, is two million co university college students in, on the secular campuses. And that was our focus. And then, as well, each of those campuses would connect with one of our partnerships internationally, and that would be the primary focus for their sending of their students to, to go to the world. Now, any student could go anywhere they really wanted. We have, for summer missions, I think we have over 70 places they can go around the world. Uh, in summer missions, uh, or, yeah, summer missions, we have about, or, yeah, summer, summer missions, we have 70 places they can go. For stint and long-term ministry, we have about 60 locations they can go at this point in time. But we started with these. Uh, these are our present six partnerships around the world. And I'm going to let Char take it from here. So some of you have noticed these windows over here. Um, actually, these were not developed, I'm sorry, just for this missions conference. <laughs> but this was a part of my responsibility in engaging our staff with our international locations and our people that are over there, both those that will come to Christ and those that are over there ministering to them, as well as um, it was also used we call our World Cafe when we have our large conference for students um, at the end of December and into the first part of January. We have about a thousand students that come from the Mid-Atlantic region. And we have a world cafe where they can engage in a lot more than this, but things that are part of the cultures and what they could expect and challenge them, pray with them about going to these places of the world. So the concept behind this is that if you were in any of these countries and looking out the windows, these are some of the things you would see. 
the people, the things they wear, the colors that are a part of it, the animals that are a part of it, the students that you might minister to. And so as you take time to look at these, it's as if you're in that country looking out and seeing some aspects of the culture as well as the displays that are here with some things from um, the country. Uh, I think that's it. Yeah. I don't think that's it. Okay. Well, I do want to point something out. I picked this up in Kazakhstan. Oh, this is hilarious. Okay, did you see this? Now, it's, it's okay. It's actually a cleanser, detergent powder, powder. But if you look at the name, it is Bar. <laughs> so, I, I do believe that if you did swallow this, you might. <laughs> so, it's very uh, appropriate description. But this happens a lot in a lot of international settings where they try to, to translate into English certain things. And so there's a border between laughing out loud when you see these in the countries and just laughing to each other about it so that you don't offend them. But some of their signs, if you, any of you have traveled, you might have noticed this in certain parts of the world. But Barf was the best, and Ron brought that home, and we had that for years. <laughs> One of the one of the exciting things. I don't know. Can you that microphone? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Okay. Oh, actually, we're really. Oh, that's right. Okay. Uh, if you look at the countries, really, where we have partnerships now, um, if you want to reach uh, and have a burden for people reaching people in Latin America, uh, we have the Dominican Republic. If there's an interest in reaching individuals that are more or less hardcore Muslims, we have an opportunity in North Africa. If you're interested in reaching um, the African people, Sub-Sahara African people, we have a partnership in Botswana. If you're interested in reaching hidden people groups uh, or cultural Muslims, uh, or those from more of a Russian and Eastern European ethnic, ethnicity, ethnicity uh, we have Kazakhstan. If you're interested in reaching Asian people, we have East Asia, which I will verbally say is China. But you'll never see anything in writing about crew in China because our mission goes beyond what a lot of organizations' mission is there. So we don't want to shame anybody by really connecting all that we do there uh, with the country. If you want to go down under, we have a partnership in Melbourne, Australia, which also is, it, you not only reach the Aussies there, but you, students from all over the eastern rim of Asia, study in Australia. And so it's an exciting place to have a ministry for that purpose. So we really, if you look across the globe, it, it really touches most of the major people groups and places that people would want to go. So our the heart for our international missions all started way back when our girls were that size and we were challenged to go into communist Romania. And actually when the year that we were challenged to go, for those of you who are younger, you'd have to learn this in history, but those of us who are older actually experienced this, but um, it was right, right on the heels of Chernobyl when there was a nu nuclear explosion, and the radiation was said to be in all the vegetables and the milk that the cows would produce and in the sand that we would walk on, and we were advised um, by a lot of well-meaning friends and family not to go. It was also just about two weeks, maybe, maybe not even that much, after there was um, a terrorist bombing in Vienna, and guess what airport we were flying into? <laughs> Vienna! So it was quite an emotional challenge. Just a couple days before we left, when we were in training for me, I wanted to pack my bags and grab the girls and run and go home and let Ron do what he wanted to do. Um, because it was frightening. But when all was said and done, it was God telling me that, that you know what, you can stay. But there's no guarantee that you're going to be any safer here because this isn't where I want you to be than if you're where I'm asking you to be. And it's been so clear that he wanted us there. 
So anyway, we went to Romania, and I think we have more pictures on Romania. Um, it was communist. Um, you read any of those old books, it was all true. It was communist, there were men with rifles and guns, we were watched by Securitate Five. Five were, we found out five were assigned to us as a family to keep their eyes on us. Um, we knew who four were, but never figure out the fifth. Yeah. Have I got time for my quick funny story? Yes. <laughs> okay. So at the end of the summer, we, we were on the beach for quite a while. And um, you don't realize how much the oppression starts to affect you. The colors were dropped, we were being followed constantly. Me going to the bread market with three little girls was being followed all the time. So this was one day near the end. I'm walking down the beach and they have trash cans on the beach. Big trash cans. And so I'm walking with the girls down the beach, looking over my shoulder, sure enough, there he is, following me, you know, a little closer up where the buildings are. And so I did one of these things. Pretended to take something out of my bag, put it in the trash can, and then I walked on to the girls and I turned around and there he was, digging through the trash. <laughs> I got home and I told Ron, and he said, you did what? <laughs> but it was a relief, it was a stress relief. <laughs> This is just part of the countryside. Um, they had, oops, back it up. So they had taken um, a lot of the people out of their tiny little homes in the country and forced them into the cities into those high-rise buildings so they could watch them and have control over them. Killed a lot of the, the horses, if not all the horses, and livestock that they had. Um, we worked with, next one, Ron. Um, well, Ron worked with, these are two pastors from Romania. And um, one was persecuted, and one had, they were both family men, and one um, had been threatened with persecution. And so, and yet there they were, meeting with us publicly, because they so wanted to learn more about God, and what we did, and how we did ministry. I think the next slide, this is, these are just some pictures from when we went to um, an underground church, a little farther away from where our base was, and met with the underground church, and it really was true. The little rooms, hot, hot as you know, and um, shutters closed. People came in over like an hour and a half to our period of time, one at a time, so they wouldn't be detected. And then we sat in that room and we taught them um, discipleship principles, how to share their faith, the gospel, and had some amazing, amazing time with them just seeing they had nothing. The Romanian people would wait in lines for hours and hours. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, hours and hours for not knowing what was at the other end of the line. It might be half a chicken, little chickens. It might be a bar of soap, but they just, you know, they didn't have things. So that was the beginning. I think that's the last. I mean, these are some of the teams that went in with us that we ministered to um, for that summer. So this, this was the beginning of our international heart and really affected our family tremendously. Our girls who, um, their value system was really transformed into things that really matter in life after being with these Romanian believers. So, okay. And so these are some of the countries over the years that we have um, had partnership with in one way or another, and had gotten to the point where they um, had their own leadership in the countries and could function without us sending there anymore. So, that's it. Yeah, Romania was a, was a challenge. I've never been so scared in all my life as we smuggled in the Jesus film uh, in Romanian with other apologetical materials translated in and um, yeah take your breath away and lean upon the Lord and uh, he was faithful so it was we have some exciting stories about that that we can't go into but it's it was an adventure to say the least as we think about our involvement in sending students and staff overseas though 
There's five stages that we identify as a part of a partnership. Really, our mission is to help reach the future leaders for the church and establish an indigenous ministry to the university students in their countries who will help to reach God's world. But we really see, and around the world, um, especially, even more so than in the States, those that really go to the universities, they are the future leaders and influencers of those countries. And so if we can reach them, we can see greater potential for Christ being glorified throughout the culture and the leadership for the church, the future church, future of the church. So that's really our mission. Uh, there's five stages, though, to a partnership. Our first stage is our short-term missions, uh, a seven to ten day vision trip, or four to six week summer missions. And the goal of those uh, opportunities is to go over, meet English-speaking university students with whom you can converse, and uh, get to know them, ask them questions, though, ask questions back, and you can share how Christ has changed your life and share the gospel. So it's exciting and it's incredibly easy to do uh, because they're inquisitive. They want to meet American University students. Stage two is where some of those students who go on the, uh, the summer mission or the vision trip, they will have had such a fantastic time that after they graduate from college, they'll want to go back for a year or two. You're legally allowed to go back for two. Um, but that's what we call our stint. ST stands for short term and INT stands for international. But it's one to two years. But if our goal is to see life transformation in the future leaders of a country and of the church raised up, it's not going to be accomplished through the efforts of the summer missions or even the stinters. The full life transformation that can take place really is, is done as things, and they understand things in their heart language. And so, therefore, we also send what we call what are our long-term staff, individuals who go over and they learn the language and have ministry experience and then really can build into the lives of the students and or the graduates of those school uh, universities that have risen to the top who really can have a long-term impact. That's stage three. Stage four is where you do have national indigenous leadership raised up. And so rather than having Americans go back for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, we raise up the leadership and then it is indigenously led. And then the fifth stage is very, very significant. Because if we raised up leaders who are only concerned about reaching their city, or only concerned about reaching their country, we have failed to teach and encourage them so that they actually embrace the heart and mission of God. They need to embrace the Great Commission. They need to become a sending nation. And this is what's really, really exciting when you see it. Because there are many, many countries in the world that, that Americans can get into. But, you know what? There, there are some people from our country that we go to in East Asia that can get into North Korea. Yeah. Uh, there are people in Kazakhstan who can get into Middle Eastern countries that we can't get into. Um, and, and so it's, it's exciting as we see uh, those countries become sending countries. Diego and uh, Nina uh, are a couple in Venezuela. And a number of years ago, they, you will notice that they are not one of our six partnerships anymore. Uh, and that is because the AD uh, came to the Lord through our first summer mission ever in Venezuela. Uh, later that year, as we sent our first stint team, uh, Nina came to the Lord. And uh, they, their life was dramatically transformed. And so they, uh, after they graduated, they both decided to join crew full-time. And they were trained and developed and eventually became a director of a major university in another city in Venezuela. Uh, they went on to really see God use them in dramatic ways. Uh, DAD is now the national campus director for Venezuela. Uh, the exciting thing is that alongside of DAV and some of the other students that came to the Lord through our ministry, a number went into church ministry. 
And so we have incredible church connections throughout Venezuela. And uh, so we see students doing that. And, and it's exciting to see that happen. In our countries that there's been previous work, Moldova, from our region, and then Sharon and I have been involved in, Moldova, Romania, Bulgaria, Egypt, and Venezuela, all five of those countries where we have sent students and done the five stages of a partnership. They're entirely indigenously led. You won't find any Americans there. And so it's exciting. And, you know, you, you take places like uh, Egypt, they're sending the places that we as Americans can't go. So it's fun. Uh, so, woo! Time's gone by. Okay. This is just quick. I just love <laughs> it's exciting living with Ron. Uh, um, this is just a picture of some of the other things we do, like stint briefing before our teams go over, before our summer missions go over, or before our one to two years go over. We gather everybody together and we do training and teaching and preparation so that they're ready to go. And this is just one year, um, quite a while ago, when we did it when the teams were a lot smaller. Um, <coughs> This is a representative of uh, mid-year conferences that, for instance, in Spain, we have one for our people, not just our people, but crew people that are in very oppressed, usually Muslim-dominated countries. And so they come in for a week and we just really bless them with, with worship, a lot of worship because they can't do it publicly in these countries, um, worship and training and counseling and all kinds of things to help them um, continue on. Uh, this was just one opportunity that we had for one summer to train, uh, okay, so Trinidad, Costa Rica, and Australia, um, they were all actually from those countries, and, we got, and the others were going to those countries, but they were U.S. people, and they were going long term, but we got to train them in leadership skills and how to, how to actually be the leaders of the ministries in those countries. So, theme verse for our life and our ministry, Romans 10, 13, 15. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. And God has led us in our ministry to uh, a ministry of mobilization uh, and of sending of students and staff and then shepherding and taking care of those staff that have gone uh, around the world and had a, a number of opportunities in even untold countries beyond even those from our region. But right now, we are going through a little bit of a transition in our own responsibilities and one, one thing that's, um, over the years, uh, even when we started out as a region, we had two partnerships, and then it grew to three, and four, and five, and six. And, uh, as far as caring for the different entities, first we started out just caring about the summer missions, and then it was summer missions and STEM, and then it was summer missions and STEM and ICS, and then it was, you know, it, it just keeps growing, okay? But I love that. I love pioneering uh, within Global Missions, I kind of coined a phrase, aggressively going and not really knowing. <laughs> and that, that's exciting to me, to, to be able to get in there and, you know, it's, you don't know how it's going to happen, it's just you and God. And that is, that is really fun and cool for me. So, um, as we think about mobilizing students to go to the world, fulfilling the Great Commission, um, Within crew across the country, we have about, well, depends which part of the year it is and, and that kind of thing. We have 60 to 70,000 university students involved in the secular university. Okay? So that's kind of that's cool. Okay? But we became aware that there are 240,000 Christian college students who go to Christian colleges and universities. And as we have thought about, you know, what God has called us to as a mission, in, into mobilizing, raising up the next generation of, of leaders and going to the world, 
uh, we have realized that we have neglected a huge portion of those st university students who might be like-minded, who really would like to trust God and go overseas and be able to reach their peers. The great thing about university students and university grads, they are the same everywhere you will go in the world. They all have their cell phones, and all over the world, university students want to learn English. And so what an incredible platform God has given university students in America today. It's a platform that's never existed in the previous 2,000 years of Christianity. And we want to um, just be use of God in, in raising up as many like-minded students as we can. And so my newest, our newest responsibility is to uh, visit, to meet the administration, uh, of the Christian universities and colleges and to see how we can serve them and to provide opportunities that are not existing with what, within with what the universities are doing already. And we've just gotten an incredible response um, uh, for one school, Liberty University. Okay, I'll, I'll, one, uh, we had a student that went to, the, to Kazakhstan two years ago and uh, he's a great guy, so much fun. And, and I got to know him at the briefing conference, and then I did the debriefing for the summer mission, and uh, we just had a fun time together. And uh, uh, he graduated from, got his master's actually, undergrad and master's uh, from Liberty. And he now uh, had such a fantastic time on our summer mission that he wanted to do a stint. And uh, he's not back in Kazakhstan, interestingly enough, but he's leaving our stint team in uh, the Dominican Republic, and we have a prayer goal that we'll see an entire stint team of four to eight um, universe, uh, Liberty University students being a stint team in the DR next year, with the goal being, ultimately, that they would be a part of the process of raising up Dominicans who can go and reach the rest of the Caribbean. Is that exciting? Woo! Yeah, Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quiet here. Shark's got one more thing to say, and I hope. Hey, some of you have seen these over there for each country. It's called Have His Heart for whichever region of the world or country it is. Um, the Have His, they're actually Have His Heart minutes that we send out electronically to all of our... Um, uh, to all of our universities in, this, um, in the Mid-Atlantic region so that they can begin to get God's heart for his world as they hear um, on a pretty, uh, every other week basis for their particular partnership that they have internationally, what God is doing in those countries and prayer requests and praise requests. And so we send out, like, there's a... A minute, have his heart minute that goes to them. And there are people responsible to see that something is read from these things that come out electronically uh, to encourage in prayer groups, in large group meeting, different facets of the ministry every week. So they're beginning to understand God really is who God says he is. God is doing some amazing things. I might want to be a part of this. Either praying, going, sending or providing funds for people to go. So it's been incredible to see what God has done with us because actually, Ron is the one who got this idea from the Lord. The Lord just stopped in those tracks, you know, actually in his car, <laughs> along a highway one day. He had to pull off the road because God was giving him this idea. And now it is in, um, I don't know how many regions now in our country, but other, other regions, um, in the U.S. with crew have picked this up and they're doing the same thing because God is using it to encourage students and motivate them. So, assuming you probably have not read any of those yet, I'm going to read one for you. This one is from East Asia. The title is What Type of Person Are You? by a, um, a couple that is there long term. Last September, so a year ago, I approached a girl after lunch and asked her where she brought, bought her bike. As we continued to meet together for lunch or coffee, 
she began to share more about her life and eventually agreed to study the Bible with me. Lonnie attended faithfully each week, eager to learn more about what Christians believe. Recently, she came to our Easter movie party, where we watched The Passion of Christ. It was incredible to watch her witness the sacrifice that Christ made for her on the cross. After the movie, we asked the question, people are divided over Jesus. Some people worship him and some reject him. Why is that? Lonnie told us it is because some people believe that they are sinful people and see their need for Jesus. Other people still believe they're good enough on their own and don't need Jesus. My teammate asked her which type of person she would say she is. Lonnie confidently said, I am ready to worship him. Because I, because I have been studying the Bible with you all, God is changing my heart. Now, after seeing this movie, I want to believe. Lonnie went home that evening and prayed to God for the first time as his daughter. Have a new sister. So you see how encouraging these things can be. Because... You trust what you're reading here. So we do have the opportunity for any of you who would like to receive from any particular country these on a regular basis. We'd be happy to send them to you electronically. Do you want me to read the other one? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, time's up. So you can read those on your own. We have other ones yeah, that constantly come out. Uh, God just is showing up around the world, and, and it's exciting to see the students' lives uh, transformed. Um, I think we're done, except that we do want to show you our family, okay? So, because God is blessed. This is uh, our oldest daughter, Michelle, and her husband, Kevin, and her six kids. Uh, five are from she and Kevin, and the sixth is adopted from Guatemala. So that is Michelle. Then this is our second daughter, Jen. Jen and Scott and their dog, Gracie. And uh, they are on staff with crew. Uh, they uh, lead the ministry at the University of Connecticut. And they just had a cool miracle in their life. They haven't been able to have children. And they've been in the adoption process. And just a couple weeks ago, after two years of waiting, uh, they found out they're, they've been selected. And they'll be picking up, hopefully, a baby in November. So that's kind of cool. And then this is our third daughter. Uh, Christy, her husband Seth, and their three boys, uh, Joshua, Andrew, and Daniel, and Seth is a senior pastor of a Baptist church in California. So God has richly, richly blessed us. It's been a fantastic journey. It's going to continue, I think, for a while. So much fun when you follow the Lord and uh, uh, what he has for your life. He is a good God. Yeah, we, we did not sign up for this for 40 plus years. <laughs> <laughs> two, two. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hey, so if anyone would like to sign up for a two-week missions trip, uh, we'll, uh, we'll see how that works out. Um, we're going to pray, and uh, we're, what we'd like to do is we kind of like help cleaning up. If you would, if you're not kitchen staff, stay this side of the kitchen. Just help... Uh, uh, get things there, and then we'll uh, get the decorations together and uh, clean up so that the teens can have a uh, fellowship hall uh, for the rest of the evening. And uh, but let's pray and be dismissed, and we can talk with uh, Ron and Char and uh, help us clean up. Father, thank you so much for an excellent conference. Thank you for those who've been faithful in ministry, Lord. And we do pray that you get others to sign up for two years or forty or eighty or whatever you decide. Father, it's a, it is an adventure, and uh, I pray that uh, none of us would consider ourselves too old, and none of us would consider ourselves too young. We begin to follow you with our whole heart. 